it's that classic cliche fridge magnet that life is about the journey, not the destination. Um, and I try and take that into, you know, things I invest in as well. It's got to be, it's got to be about the product and it's got to be about the people as well. Welcome to this week's Escape Your Limits podcast. Today, we're in Hollywood speaking with a very accomplished health and wellness entrepreneur who manages to split his time between his main career as a successful Hollywood actor, appearing alongside the likes of Bruce Willis and Nicolas Cage. And when he's not traveling the world filming movies, he's working on his business ventures, which include Dog Pound, Climber, Cali Water, Next Health, and Lasso. We cover a lot of fascinating subjects in our interview, including the number one success secret he learned from a business tycoon, and what will the future of the health and wellness space look like. So please welcome the CEO of Hollywood Media, Mr. Oliver Trevina, to this week's Escape Your Limits podcast. Oliver, thank you for inviting me to your wonderful, was it bachelor pad, is it, would you call it? Uh, I mean, let's call it a home. A home, yeah. <laughs> You've got your mum and dad downstairs. My mum and dad are downstairs, <laughs> so it's definitely not a bachelor pad at the moment, yeah. We're pretty much in every night watching movies, eating a bar of chocolate, and, uh, and that's, that's it. Yeah. It's not all showbiz then? Not all showbiz, not no. all showbiz, yeah. So how do, how's a boy from Hastings, I, I've, I've been to Hastings years ago, how, how, you know, how do you end up in, we're in Hollywood Hills, you know, how, how, do, you, how do you kind of get here? Um, I don't think the podcast is long enough. It was, <laughs> uh, it's, it was random. Um, I guess the simplest, quickest way of explaining it is uh, I'm the youngest of four boys. Um, so my mum and dad, have, they do have family businesses. They have a small trucking company and then a local car garage. Um, so all the brothers work for the family business. And uh, I think mum wanted a little girl. <laughs> and she didn't get a little girl. So uh, I was quickly in theatre school at like four years old. And that kind of led me to leave Hastings at a young age and move to London. And then from that, brought me to the States. Right. Um, so yeah, that was a big part. Um, you did ballet, didn't you? I Good. did ballet, yeah. Right. yeah. I did ballet for 12 years. Did ballet for 12 years, did tap, modern, danced. I, I, I guess danced my way out of Hastings. So there right. you go. Yeah. Did you get... I, I, I did... Uh, my grandfather... I never said this. I don't know whether I, I'm going to get some stick about this. I, I did classical ballroom and Latin dancing for there a long time. Go. I used to get all the stick at school. So yeah. did you used to have a hard time with your mates? Or um, were they all right about it? Uh, I had a hard time. <laughs> I guess uh, not to go too dark. But yeah, I had a hard time to the point of being beaten, to, beaten into a coma. Oh, Three guys got charged and put, put in jail or prison. Um, we call it back in the UK. Yeah, it was pretty, pretty bad when I was like uh, just about to leave for a show. Gee. Um, so that, that was a turning point for me that was like, you know, after I finally like, you know, came out of hospital, recovered, I was like, I'm, uh, I think I'm ready for a change. Yeah. Um, and that was it. So it really wasn't like, obviously it was tough at the time, but when you look back, it's funny, my mum always has this saying that's like, life makes sense in reverse. And it is so true. In the moment you can never see, you know, you're like, why the f would this make sense, mm. you know? Um, and then you get down the line, you're like, oh, it kind of did push me to, you know, I guess step out more of my comfort zone. Because even though I, I, I love the arts, and there wasn't a lot of that at the time in Hastings. There's definitely a lot more now. I still love my family, you know, so I could never see myself if someone would have been like, would you ever move to another country, let alone America? I'd be like, no way. You know, my brother's here. I play football with them every weekend. Like it's that, that comfort zone. So sometimes it takes something, I guess, drastic or, you know, a big moment in life to push you out of that comfort zone and do something different. So mm. um, that was definitely the moment for me. What about acting then? How, what, what was your sort of big break when you thought you're actually going to go somewhere with that as a, as, as a what is it, as, as a, you call it a trade? What do you, what, a trade, what you... yeah, I guess so. Um, I mean, for me, the, I, I, well, for us, I guess the funny thing about England is that even when I went to theatre school and I had, you know, did, did my stuff there, you have to do all three. So you have to act, you have to dance, you have to sing, you know, like you never, it, I remember there was so many of my, you know, like fellow students or classmates that we get fr so frustrated because you're like, I don't want to sing. You know, I enjoy acting or I don't want to, I want to dance, I don't want to act. And, and to get any scholarship, you kind of have to do all three over there. It's, uh, it's different. I think it's started to be implied in the US more now. Um, so, you know, I, I mean, I did shows like The Nutcracker. I did, you know, a ton. So it, everything was dance, but also, you know, I had to be trained as an actor as well. Um, but career wise, I guess, you know, my career took a different path um, in the US because I'm trying to do the, the math now, but it's probably now 13, 14 years ago, I got offered a hosting gig. So I, I fell into hosting, um, right. presenting. Um, we call it TV presenting back in the UK, but I got offered a hosting gig and that lasted. Was that Young Hollywood? Young Hollywood, yeah. Right. So I did Young Hollywood um, and then did a lot of like, you know, the pre-shows for the American Music Awards, the, the billboards, um, did a show for the Hollywood Reporter. 
And, and that was something that I was never trained in, never, was never on the list of like, you know, if I had a vision board, I'd never put up their TV host. Um, but it was amazing and it was incredible and I enjoyed it. It was, it was great. As you know, you get to meet a ton of different people and made a lot of friends through it and, you know, learned a lot. And then it got to a point for me where, and it was kind of strange because it was a point career-wise where I was really getting some momentum as a host, but I also felt kind of stuck. Mm. Um, I, I, I don't know, five, 10,000 interviews and you, you know, you're meeting all these people, you're asking questions, but also when you're interviewing actors and musicians, there's only so much you can talk about, especially like movie junkets, because yeah. you can't give away any of the movie. So you've seen the film, but you can't really talk about the film and you can't talk about this and you can't talk about that. And it's like, why am I here? <laughs> um, so for me, I just wanted, I wanted a challenge again. And I was like, I really miss acting and I wanted to get back into acting and give it another go. Um, my reps at the time definitely thought I was nuts. So, because uh, they were like, why you've got, you know, you've got a regular job in, in, in entertainment to have a regular job is, you know, is like 1%. Mm. Um, so I, uh, I took a gamble and uh, they parted ways. So I was left with no representation and no job um, and found a new agent and, uh, and a new manager and, and, you know, kind of booked a couple of good jobs. And luckily the last three, four years has been, you know, I've done at least like two, three movies a year and it's been, it's been fun. It must have been quite daunting because you, you read and you watch the movies, the amount of people that have the dream to come to Hollywood and be, become actors or actresses and, 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 and they totally fail. It, right. know, there must be so much competition to, to get into it. What, yeah. what do you think, what, you know, what, what do you think sort of, one, from an internal perspective, what made you think that you were going to do it when so many people before you hadn't? I think it's kind of like, it's like a bug. It's like an addiction. It's like you, because you are turned down so much. I mean, really? Steve, even for me now, it's not like I'm a, you know, there really is a, like a level of, I'd love to know the stats, but there must be like, you know, half a percent, if 1% of actors that actually like just go from job to job, you know, they don't have that risk of having to audition and be told no and, and all that. So for most, including me, it's still a case of, you know, you audition, you get so close, um, you get told you've got it and then you don't get it. And it's this roller coaster constantly of emotions. Um, so that part of it is really tough. I think f for me, uh, I guess the reason it didn't stop me is because I genuinely love doing it. And for me, that's what shifted even in the last few years is now, you know, I'm not, I'm very, very lucky and very grateful that I'm not really, I'm not acting because I want to get paid. I'm acting because I love doing it. You know, I love being on set. I love you know, that challenge. I think, you know, for me, it's like, we're who, we're who we are every day. So when someone says, oh, you're gonna play an Irish arms dealer, or you're gonna do this, suddenly I'm like, oh shit, I've got to, I've got to pay attention. I've got to, you know, get into this. And, and it's suddenly you're challenged again. And, and every movie set is different, you know, different challenges in different ways, whether it's the stunts you've got to do, whether it's, you know, the, the character you're playing, the lines you're delivering, everything is always different. So I like that part of it. But I think, you know, I'm very lucky to, to be in a place on the business side and the investment side and everything else that I love as well, that gives me that freedom to be like, you know, oh, do you want to do this film? It's not going to pay you, you know, what we pay other, you know, but I can go and do it, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so it's, I guess I'm, I'm leading with, uh, with passion as opposed to thinking about, you know, the, the payment, right. passion before payment. That's quite a good line, passion before payment. Yeah, it's good. Keep catchy, that. Isn't That's it? mine. Yeah. What, it wasn't it. <laughs> I heard you talk about taking risks and um, even in the acting side, you talk about certain, I listened to you on a podcast and you was explaining about certain actors and actresses take risks as actors, but when it comes into the business world, they're a little bit more afraid of that. Do you think some of the skills of what you've learned are being rejected a hell of a lot um, and, and also having a pretty interesting business career, do, do you think that there's a lot of similarities between you know, what you've done on, on the acting, the audition, and, and what it takes to, to have a successful business, which also you get a huge amount of, of rejection. Course, of course, yeah, I mean, it's the same thing. I mean, in any, especially in a startup world, you know, it's, uh, it's no, 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 until you get a yes, and then it's yes, no, yes, no, yes, no, and then you get a few yeses, and then it builds up, and then suddenly, like, you know, it's uh, you're off to the races, I guess. Um, but yeah, I think I think the one thing I learned it's there's a mate, uh, the, one of my dearest friends, a guy called Lyndon Lee, and he's a big kind of you know successful businessman. Um, he had a I can't remember the quote now, but I do remember the meaning of it. But it was a big long quote. I'll have to send it to you in his office in London, in his home office in London, and it was basically 
in a nutshell, it, it was basically persistence pays off. You know, nothing will beat persistence. Um, no, no training, no whatever. Really? I've got to find it because it was so powerful at the time. And it was like, it's kind of resonated with me because I, I had that mentality with, with what I was doing in the entertainment business because you have to, because you're told no so many times. And then I think seeing it on the wall of a businessman that really, you know, he himself came from nothing, like zero to then multi, you know, billion dollar businesses. It kind of resonated was like, wow, that really, do, it really is something that is, is across the board. Like if you persi- persist, and you just continue to do it, um, I mean, your chances are a lot higher. Nothing's right. definite in this, in this world, but your chances are a lot higher if you don't give up and you carry on, you know. So you've worked with some very successful people like Bruce Willis on your last movie, um, and you must come across people that have reached that level and, and you know, very small number of people, I guess, you know, like the people like The Rock and, and that sort of stuff that you probably would have never thought they'd be the biggest actors in the world right, right. if you look at where they started from but in, in your experience and when you see these people that have kind of got to that level that you may be aspire to would you say that quote about persistence talent's good but do, do you think that that if you've got that grit and you're never going to give up do you think that kind of outweighs some of the talent in some 100%. way 100 percent. really i think it outweighs talent completely <laughs> and i don't mean this in a mean way but the Rock was a wrestler. It was a WWE, right? It was a yeah. It was a wrestler. There is no part of that that says he should then become the biggest movie star. Um, he, I, in my eyes, he became the biggest movie star because he clearly wanted to, and you know, and he had that vision and persisted and and you know just continued and continued and worked and worked and worked and got there. Um, that's not to say The Rock isn't talented, but I don't think the you know The Rock wasn't trained at RADA or you know studied Shakespeare or became a thespian you know at the age of 12 and training this the rock was just like i'm gonna be the biggest movie star and i'm gonna get there and persisted until he got there so I, but then you know don't get me wrong then you've got you know people like meryl streep and you know leonardo dicaprio that are just truly talented hmm. so i think i'm trying to do the you know the balance but it's yeah. like talent for sure pays off but persistence for sure for sure pays off and if you can maybe you know merge the two you know then you're then you're gonna win what about? Because there, there's talented people that don't want to work as well, right? Yeah. There's talented people that are like, oh, it's going to come to me. I'm just going to sit at home. I'm so talented. <laughs> and it's not going to happen. No. So I think you have to, it, it, I guess, talent and drive. The right. two, then the, the, you know, then the two. And if you train and you have knowledge of what you do um, and you have persistence, you know, the odds are in your favor. Right, right, okay. And if, if, you, if, if you think about, you know, like your when you came into business like how how what what part does connections play into it because um i I interview a lot of people and certainly the whether it's people that like mentors or or other connections you know i I see a pattern in that as well in in success but do you think i suppose you know coming english guy from hastings in the middle of kind of nowhere in some respects yeah we have we have this we got the seaside (laughs) we've got the water we've got a pier and fish and chips that's it that's our selling point of hastings i heard the pier's not there anymore as well it it? got burned down (laughs) we did have a pier it got burned down some lads burnt it down because i guess they had nothing better to do and then we they built another pier but the new pier is pretty shit so don't come for the pier come for the fish and chips um that's it (laughs) so so what what part would you say that connections and, and, and people that you have around you and or people that you choose to kind of create? Because I, I guess going back to Hastings, you must have had a lot of mates and, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, I don't know what, what, they, what they do, but how, how, how does that affect where you go both in, you know, in Hollywood and also some of the things that you've done in business? I think the people you surround yourself with is everything. Because I look at like, I mean, trust me, I haven't lived, a, you know, even since coming to America, it's definitely been a, you know, there's been some really low points as well. Um, some really tough times, some really, you know, dark times. There's been, you know, there's been it all. And I think when you look back, you know, you, you're responsible for yourself. So there's no part, you know, that, but that other people play in that. But you're definitely uh, influenced by the people around you. Mm. You know, it's, tough. It's, it's hard to live a healthy life if, you know, 10 of your mates want to go out and smash it every, every night. It's mm. hard to, you know, be a successful business person if you're surrounded by 10 people that just want to sit and watch movies all day long. So I think, of course, you know, the people you surround yourself with are, are going to play a, a role in, in, in what you do. Um, so I think, yeah, you, you, the, the people you're connected with, without a doubt. And I think it's a, you know, it's a balance. You want to be, 
you don't just want to surround yourself with people that drive you in business because you know you'll you'll get you'll get rich and get depressed mm. i think you need a balance of of people and i'm i'm lucky enough to like you know i'm so grateful for the people i'm surrounded with from you know the business people that teach me from you know family to you know to friends that will just tell me it straight you know um i think honesty is a big one as well you've got to surround yourself with honest people and i, I you know i think that was t i think that's tough when you're growing up because you don't always want to hear the honest answer you know when someone's like you're a prick and by the way, I keep using bad language. I don't know if I'm allowed to. It's too late now. So, um, but you're, uh, you know, you're out of order, or you're doing something wrong. And you're like, no, I'm not. And you push that person to the side, and then you come to realise that the the honest ones are, are what you need to keep around. You know. Um, so yeah, I, I think uh, to answer your question, the people that surround you are extremely important. Did you come out here with any of your mates, or did you come out on your own? No, I came. I came out here pretty much on my own. Um, I'd come out uh, in the very beginning, like on a on a vacation, um, and then met, took a few meetings, and then uh, ended up moving out here. And then a, a dear friend of mine, um, uh, Robbie Williams, who you you know you'll know because you're British, um, he lived out here, and and I'd like kind of made a few friends, and then you know Robbie was kind enough to take me in as well. I ended up like living with Robbie for a couple of years. And, and built a great community of people. To be honest, most of the community I built at the time was through football. I played football. Um, that was the other thing I did growing up. Mum had me in ballet and dad had me in football. So it, it kind of balanced it out. I think dad was desperate for me to be a good footballer to just save his ass in the pub. <laughs> so at least if they were like, we just saw your son in tights, he could be like, yeah, but do you see that goal he put in the back of the net? Um, so, uh, so yeah, most of the people I met, you know, because obviously you gravitate to what you know you love and you know, and football was a big part of my life. So there'd be like football games going on or pickup games going on, and I'd always join in and met a ton of people through that. A lot of them to this day that I still play football with and still dear friends with, right. you know. So was was that easy? Was that sort of? Uh, did you have a conscious effort to stay on the right track? Because I, I watched some of your young Hollywood um, videos, and it it looked as though you're having a great time, you're meeting, you know, all the, you know, girls and some crazy yeah. people on that show. And I suppose it, like, you must have been able to get in all the best bars and clubs and all that kind of thing. And right. How, did, was it something that you had to sort of, because I can imagine being younger and just like losing my way in that whole thing. 100% lost my way. 100% <laughs> lost my way. Um, to be honest, when I look back, without a doubt, from, it was, it, it, it really is funny because, when I look back on some of the years that from the outside, without a doubt, looked the best, they were my darkest days. I mean, I was in a, I won't go too into it, but um, I definitely had some, some times where I was like, I don't want to be here anymore. You know, I found myself in a depression that I, I couldn't even explain. And I think that was the hardest thing as well, because it was like, why do I feel this way when it all looks great and I'm doing this? And that was where it like kind of realized like a turning point for me was like, I need to figure something out. I need to change something. Um, and I can't keep changing this stuff. I've got to figure out what's going on with me. Mm. Um, and also choices, for sure. I mean, of course, like, you know, you're in LA, you're, you're living this uh, 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 life and it's like, the, you know, the FOMO culture. I definitely had that. It was like, oh no, okay, yeah. I just went out last night, but yeah, I'll come to this <laughs> premiere tonight and we'll go to the after party and I'll be up till four and I'll be up at work and at seven. It was just like, it was chaos. Um, and you eventually burn out. You right. know, I think that's a, that's a tough thing in, in Hollywood and, and th these kind of fast paced cities that we live in is, and that's where I think it comes to the people around you as well. You know, if, you, if you're just in that circle and you're constantly trying to keep up, you're gonna burn out, you know? Um, and sadly, you know, I've, I've lost a few friends to, to, to that world, you know, in, in whether it's overdose, you know, addiction, depression, it's a, it's a tough thing, it catches up with you. And we're also in a city where, you know, I joked about it earlier being like, you know, I'm insecure, but the truth is I, you know, I'm 40 years old and I'm doing really well, but I'm still insecure. Mm. You know, I still have to pay attention to those voices in my head that tell me I'm not doing good enough or tell me I'm, I'm not enough or, oh yeah, it's all gonna fail or this, you know, it's a, it's a constant, constant battle. And then you throw, you know, social media into it yeah. and everything else. And it's, you know, it's, it's tough. It's a, you know, it's a, it's a regular conversation. Um, by the way, that's a dog, if someone can hear. It's a, it's a neighbor's dog, very angry at this podcast. Um, it's a constant uh, conversation about, you know, when you think about the younger generations and stuff like that, having to grow up with social media and things like that. I can't even imagine it. Yeah. I don't think I would have made it to today because my mind just overthinks everything. So I try and like limit social media even myself now. Um, but yeah, it was... Uh, 
Yeah, and that's what I mean. It's definitely been a roller coaster, you know. What what kind of got you back on track then? Because um, I suppose, you know, once you get, I, I I I should imagine once you get onto that spiral, you can start losing gigs, and your you know your reputation can quite easily. It's like, well, why was he in this place? I'm not touching that bloke, you know. Of course, of course. I think, I think. I mean, that's the weird thing about Hollywood, though. It's still there's still so many. Uh, I don't know. I look around. I'm like, what the fuck are you still doing? Why are you still doing that? You know, why are you still living that way? Mm. Um, and you try not to judge, but it's coming from a place of like, don't do that. You know, there's, there's other things you can do. There's another way to live. Um, I think for me, what shifted it was just, I think, hitting like a low point. You know, I, I think awareness. Because as you know, like if, well, not as you know, but I, I'm, I'm assuming you know, you seem to have your life pretty structured in the, in the, in the, hour, that I've, in the hour that I've known you. Yeah. Um, I'm 51, so it's taken me yeah, a while. Yeah, exactly. But I think it's that like, it's like some, you, you develop an awareness or you don't develop an awareness, right? So you either continue on that kind of path. And, and by the way, I have friends of mine that I kind of admire in a way because they don't have that like, you urge. know what I'm trying to say. <laughs> yeah. Well, they, they don't have that urge or they don't have that guilt. Yeah. Like you can, well, yeah. you can go guilt, out until yeah. four in the morning, right. get hung up. My hung, hangovers were always terrible because I'd be like, oh, I should have been up. Or, I should have done the gym already. Yeah. I should have achieved so much already. And it's 10 a.m., yeah. you know? Whereas if you can just sleep in and eat a cheeseburger and fries and yeah. switch on Sunday football, then great. You know, there's Maybe nothing wrong with that Maybe it's good that, that you either. don't have that. Maybe it's good that you... you you know, you don't have that's that. what I think. Yeah. That's what. I, and by the way, you know, there's a it's a blessing and a curse. Mm. I think the 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 same uh, thoughts that I guess I don't want to say beat myself up because that's never good. But that voice that's like, come on, you could you could you should be doing more. You should mm. be you should be out of bed by now. You should be like truly. I don't. I even you know I had a friend's birthday last night and I get in at one a.m. and I'm still my alarm still set for six, mm. you know, and that's not healthy. I'm not saying like you should get your seven eight hours of sleep or whatever your you know your prime uh, sleep pattern is, um, but that same voice that you know pushes me is is also the same voice that you know will of course like burn you out. But it's so it's about finding that balance, finding what works for you, and and knowing when you're pushing it too far, knowing when you need to take time off. And I think that's for me now is the hardest thing that I find in life is is finding that work life balance. Um, a definitely, you know, a healthier way than I used to live. But now, you know, with uh, with success comes a lot of opportunities as well, mm-hmm. which I'm very grateful for. But at the same time, it's hard to juggle it as well, you know. So you're you're in the health and fitness space, invested in it with your Hollywood. Is it Hollywood Media? It's Hollywood Media. I don't oh. know what I'm. I, by the way, that was that That's was a my cool name actually. I call there's it a that. there's a dear friend of mine. Uh, he's a scouser uh, called Chris Dyson. He's he's a real estate agent, and uh, we met very early. I met him in, in our, both of our very early days in Hollywood, and I think we used to go out a lot. And he just used to be like, oh, Hollywood. Um, because I used to, you know, know a lot of people and be kind of in the thick of it. And he wasn't in the thick of it because he was, you know, in, in real estate. Um, so he'd call me Hollywood. And eventually I was <laughs> like, you know, that's kind of a good company name because I had to set up an LLC. And this is going back a while before it was a, before I was doing any investments or anything. So I've always had that corporation. So um, who knows? I might have to change it or might keep it. But, you know, it's funny. Thank you for supporting the Escape Your Limits podcast. If you're thinking about creating a unique and engaging fitness space to take your fitness to the next level, then we have you covered. Escape Fitness design and manufacture some of the most innovative, attractive, and durable functional training and free weight equipment used by many of the best trainers and fitness brands across the globe. As a valued listener, we are offering you a 10% discount off many of the products on our website. You can check out the full range by going to escapefitness.com and use the code DUMBELL. That's escapefitness.com using the code DUMBELL. That's it for me. Please enjoy the rest of this interview. So moving into that, do you find getting this balance, have you now kind of found a way of um, taking a step away, whether it's like meditation or, or some form of fitness or activity that just sort of brings you back because I, 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 I'm the same. I struggle with it. I'm, I, you know, I'm, I seem, I'm a bit of an all or nothing person. Yep. So even when I am on a good roll and then it, like at the end of last year, it's like kind of December and there was parties a lot. And you just, you know, you kind of, um, you just go over the flow yeah. and it's like, I'm okay, like I Pringles. need to. Pringles is the simplest way of putting it. <laughs> yeah. If I pop well, open that Pringles packet, <laughs> I'm eating all of them. That is the same with everything. Yeah. You know? So I've gone, I've, I'm in January and I'm like, you know, 
clean. I'm not, I'm, I'm not drinking anything. Yeah, yeah. And so, so I have to do, I have to in or I'm out. But yeah. have, have you found any sort of ways of getting that you know, keeping yourself centered and focused. Um, my one, my, my main go-to thing is breath work. Completely changed my life the last day, I would say, really during COVID. Um, someone sent me like a, I actually went and did a course. It was nothing to do with breath work, but it was called 40 Years of Zen. I don't know if you've heard of it. Dave mm-hmm. Asprey is one of the guys behind it. It's neuroscientist. They kind of, uh, it's like a brain hacking place. Okay. So you sit in these pods. Sounds really weird now. I sound very Hollywood. Um, <laughs> but it's up in Seattle and I did like, uh, five days on this course, which was amazing. It's basically they, they kind of use neuroscience and neurofeedback to, to hack your brain in a way that releases trauma. Um, and the main thing of that is because obviously, you know, we survive as humans because we, we, we push trauma down. You know, that's why we're not always panicking. But right. like, uh, that's also unhealthy because it catches up with you. Um, I think the reference they use, and I might be wrong, so please people don't get angry, but like zebras don't get, don't ever like, carry stress because when they get chased by a lion and there are videos on YouTube I did look, do some research but when they get chased by a lion and then they survive they do this like shake thing and that's them that was me doing a zebra um, <laughs> they then release uh, their trauma and then they go back All to just right. grazing and you see their tail wagging and they're happy we do the opposite we like trauma boom 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 and then eventually it gets to a place where you can't remember it so you're feeling a certain way and okay, you don't know yeah. why you're feeling that way. Like there's so many times, like someone's like, why, why, why are you feeling like everything's fine? Or why does the sound of a door slam, you know, slamming cause you that? So this place tries to unravel a lot of that. Right. Um, which, is, uh, which is why I went, because obviously when I was beaten up and jumped, okay. classic English mentality was like, right, you're fine. Come on, let's yeah, go. Move on with it. And I think eventually it, it definitely caught up with me because I was, I was very uh, living with a daily fear for no reason. Right. You know, like I was like... <laughs> Like that, and I just didn't. I just that that was normal for me, and it wasn't until like someone was like, yeah, "There's something that ain't normal." Like you shouldn't. A therapist was kind of like, "That's not, you know, there's something there." And I'm like, "I'm fine," um, and eventually I went back and you know did a lot of this unraveling. Anyway, cut a long story short, the lady there um, who was amazing, a lot better than this fucking dog, <laughs> um, was. Uh, what do I know? Okay. Um, um, that she gave me this breath work thing. It was a little YouTube thing. And, uh, and it was amazing. It's like uh, tw- 18 minutes long. And so I started doing that and then started studying different breath works. Obviously, there's Wim Hof, things like that. Um, there's an energy breath work that I do every morning now. It's like five minutes long. Um, and it just, it, it changes it. And I think re- for men especially, we don't really breathe that well. Yeah. You know, we're very... Um, Women, you know, are incredible. I mean, let's be honest, they're better than us because they're more calm, they're more structured, they're more, you know, there's so much about a woman that they, that's, that's better than men because they just, they're not, you know, it's like we're reactionary and I think we're just too tense all the time. Like, mm. I see it in my friends, I see it with people around me and it's like, you know, we're, we're that way. And I found that myself, I was like, as soon as you just took a like breath, you were, you were so much better. So then breath work for me is that. Like I catch myself having a tough day and you know, you're caught in LA traffic and you're stressed and I'll just pull over and do like a, a few minutes of just breathing. And then you're like, oh, okay. Like I'm, I'm, I'm way more stressed than I should mm. be. This is actually fine, you know? Like whatever's happening, it's all right. Yeah. Um, so breath work is a big one for me. Are you, I heard you went, you, you was with a monk in Thailand as well. What was that I like? have been with a monk in Thailand. Um, it, was, it, was, uh, it was amazing. It was definitely an experience. Um, it's crazy. I've spent a lot of time in Thailand. Um, I have a, work with an organization called Not For Sale over there, which is against slavery and human trafficking around the world. And one of our first shelters is in Thailand. A um, lot of kids that have been rescued. Um, and every time I go there, like, it's, it's, it's crazy how much you learn from these kids because they've been through more than, I talk about my troubles, like they've been through, I mean, it's heartbreaking and you can't even imagine, you know? Um, And yet they're walking around smiling, you know, they're they're grateful for their bowl of rice that they have and grateful to just play, you know, the game, literally when I arrive at the shower, it's like, let's play rock, paper, scissors. It's all they want to do all day long. And the biggest joy comes from that game. And then you, you kind of start thinking like, what am I doing? Like how, and in a weird way, like how are they happier than I am? You know, we've got the cell phones, we've got the clothes, I've got the new shoes, and it just teaches you so much. Don't get me wrong, I land back in, you know, into our culture, and soon I'm like, oh, you know, want the new Air Jordans. Um, (laughs) Proper midlife crisis. Um, 
so no, but they, they taught me so much and I wanted to go a bit deeper that time and someone had, you know, told me about this place um, in Chiang Rai. Um, and so I visited and, and spent a bit of time with the monks and, and it was funny because you do this like meditation training and, uh, and I, was, I was terrible at meditating. I'm still not that great at it, which is why I also go to breath work because I'm actually actively doing something and I find that to be my med meditation. Mm. But you had to sit in silence and you know, you'd start with 20 minutes, then an hour, then two hours, then you, know, you would really continue it. And the only reason why I was doing it was because I was promised that at the end of it, I could ask the head monk one question. And I was like, that's you, you know, like no one gets to do this. That's a great story, you know, I come up in a podcast, which it has, so I'm thankful for that. Um, but it was like this one question and, and I got to, it got to the day and I walked up to him and he just had this like grin on his face. Like gen probably the happiest person I've ever seen in my life. Like, you know, when someone's smiling and you're like, what, I want that. Yeah. And I asked him like, what's the, what's the, you know, the classic worst question <laughs> that I'm sure he's been asked a million times. I couldn't think of anything else. Um, changed my mind about five times that morning. And I said to him like, What's the, you know, what's the key to happiness? Because he looked so happy. It just like, it ended up, it wasn't the question I was going to ask. It ended up just changing. What was you going to ask? What was um, it was even worse. <laughs> it was like, well, it was more about like me, I guess. Like, okay. you know, what should I, what should I be doing differently? And it was like, it was terrible. Um, now looking back on it, I'm so glad I didn't ask that one. Um, but I asked him, I said, what's the, what's the key to happiness? And he said, t t you, too many, you have too many choices. Take away, take away, take away choices. Wow. And it was a weird question to like have answered in that way. And I left that day and I was like, that's, that's like odd. Like, why would you take away choices? That's like imprisonment. Like my mind went so many different ways. And then I got back to LA and I went to one of my favorite little, like at the time, my favorite <coughs> little like uh, coffee shops, restaurants called Toast Bakery on Third Street. Have you been? There's some people here, Toast Bakery. And I sat there and I got, this, got their menu, which I used to love. And I opened up this menu and it, it's one of those menus that you open up and it goes that way. And it was the, the first time in like that month that I felt so stressed in a stupid way. Cause I'm like, I don't know what I want to eat. Like what I just, uh, you know, suddenly I'm thinking, do I want soup? Do I want a sandwich? And then I was like, oh my God, that's kind of like the reference that I think, you know, and then obviously there's all these books and it's not rocket science, but all on, you know, minimalism and, you know, uh, how there's friends of mine that will wear their black jeans, black T-shirt, black, you know, and that's there. And it yeah, is a yeah. lot of those times in just everyday life. I'll be like the choices that we're faced with that are really completely pointless. Do you think we, we also create? Yeah too much choices 100%. ourselves, you know, like almost imagine there's too many things to think about instead of stripping it all back. Yeah. Yeah. Without a doubt, without a doubt. Too many choices and then you have, you know, <laughs> then you overthink, then you, you know, all that that comes with having those choices, which then I learned that, I guess, learned more about his answer in the way of like, it didn't mean like take away your choices and lock you up. It meant more like, you know, take away those things that we really don't need or we think we need, yeah. you know? Um, and also, I guess, for com you know, committing to something as well, because I suppose when you're constantly out on the look for something, you're not committing to one thing. So you're never actually moving forward. You just say, oh, well, it's you know, your distractions as well, I right, suppose. Right, but, yeah. right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, that was my time with the monk. And do, have, you, have you since um, implemented that as in a way that you've gone on a different trajectory in any way, do you think? No. no, I mean a little bit for sure, 100%. Because that's well, the problem with a lot of this well. stuff, you know, you, you, well, you hear like it. it's like a rubber but... band. It's, it really is like a rubber band. And that's why, like, I mean, it's only really during COVID, but I would go to, to Thailand at least, like, once a year, if not twice a year, and just, like, you know, live the basic kind of, with the basic necessities and stuff like that, because it's kind of a nice reset. Um, and get away from technology and, and this world, because it, it does help you, shift back into like what matters who you are what you want to do but in all honesty the trouble is is the the strength of what we're around like the cell phones the social media the the culture you are pulled back in it's really tough mm. to stay to daily practice right um mm. all of that stuff um it definitely yeah i've definitely changed ways of life i mean I, every day i start my morning with a gratitude list um to just remind myself of you know because it's so easy to wake up want, wanting, right? It's like you wake up and you're like, oh, I want to do this. I want to get there. I want to, I want to do this today. And, and that's great because it's your drive. But at the same time, you forget like you're already okay. You're already doing fine, you know? 
you've got a roof over your head, you've got, you know, whatever it is, we can all find something to be grateful for. And I think like that's that the gratitude is like the most powerful thing, you know, whatever stage you're at in your life. You like, you know, you go through a breakup and you're like, I, I don't want even want to be here. This is the world's over and you can't see anything but the breakup. But if you just rewound it a bit, you're like, actually just had a lovely dinner. I've got great friends. I've got a job. I've got a roof over my head. And it starts to just shift that thing that, OK, I'm going to be I'm going to be all right, you know. Mm. And then you go back to crying. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a daily practice. But yeah, I definitely, I think once again, awareness. Awareness has definitely uh, grown for me, which, is a, which has been a great thing. Because as I say, it's not that those, it's not that the internal voices or, you know, the negative voices that we all have um, have gone away. But they don't like, they don't beat me anymore. It was a great book I, I read a, a long time ago. It was a British psychiatrist. Uh, it's called The Chimp Paradox. Oh, okay. I think I've heard about it. And it's about like the voices being a chimp. <clears throat> and so you're never going to get rid of the chimp. And the chimp's really strong. So you've so you got to stop trying to win over the tri- chimp. But you've just got to like become friends with it. Like you know it's there. So that's how the voices are for me. It's like I sound like a nut job now. <laughs> um, I'm with it, you. You know I'm, what I yeah, mean? Yeah, no, so it's I, like, I totally oh, get it. I hear you. <laughs> you know? It's all good, you know. It's more of that. So it's it's a, uh, and that's where I think the awareness comes in. I think having the awareness and, and uh, understanding yourself and your mind and the the the, the way things work is, uh, and I also think that's probably just a little bit of getting older as well, you know. Yeah, yeah, I, I think it is. So coming back to that Hollywood, how do you apply that um, same principle to your business? Because I, I went onto the website and I was. I was blown away by the amount of different investments that you've got, and you know, I've got one business, and it's quite difficult. How, how do you um, how do you sort of spread that attention and decide what to focus on? Um, <coughs> it's actually it's it's been an interesting time um, these last uh, couple of weeks, actually coming into the new year, because there's been some great opportunities that have come my way, and I really want to be. Uh, I never want to get involved in anything that I can't devote my time to. Um, unless I'm, you know, there's two ways of doing it. I either, some, some things I've just invested, you know, I'm like, oh, this is a, you know, this is great. I'm going to invest. And it's just a, it's just a capital investment. It's like, there's my money. And then there's some, you know, a lot of what I do, I would say, you know, for companies that I'm involved in, um, that I do give, you know, I'm very involved. Um, so there's not, it has to make sense. It has to be authentic. I have to believe in it. Like the biggest thing for me is, you know, people are talking to me about, have been for a long time, many years now, like the crypto world and the NFT world. And trust me, like some of my friends have done amazing and remind me of it every time how they tried to get me in on it. But I don't understand it and I can't see it and I can't experience it and I can't, you know, there will be a day when you can. Yeah. Um, but for me, I like to invest in what I enjoy and what I'm passionate about. And I feel like that's what I've done along. I mean, you know, good plug. Thank you for that. Drinking, <laughs> drinking Cali water. Um, you know, I love Cali water, truly. Um, and, I, you know, I'm in business with my best friend and there's a ton of friends involved as well. And, and that for me is, you know, it's that classic cliche fridge magnet that life is about the journey, not the destination. Um, and I try and take that into, you know, things I invest in as well. It's got to be it's got to be about the product and it's got to be about the people as well. You know, if, if the product's incredible and it's amazing, it's going to make billions of dollars, but the people around it, I don't like, or we don't get along, then that's going to be a really unenjoyable journey, you know? Um, and if the people are incredible and the product's good, but you could get it there and you could get, get it to be great. I'm definitely more up for that, you know? Um, and then if you get an incredible product and incredible people, it's like, where do I sign? Mm. Um, have you learned that through, experience and making mistakes for or have you sure. learned that from advice no trial and error for sure 100 percent. Right. Yeah. there were definitely a few businesses <clears throat> in the early days that i'd like you know I, I liked it and i'd write write a check for or i'd give up my time for because you know the other thing is as well is in investing is you know sometimes you are coming into deals and you're you know you're writing a, a small check but you're getting more shares because of your time and i've realized like that's one thing i've learned is your time is probably worth more than the check you're writing mm. um and I definitely put a lot of time into some things that I probably shouldn't have in the beginning. Um, you know, just very quick to be excited and be like, oh, I'm going to have a piece of this. Yeah, of course. I'd, you know, I'd, I'll open up my network and try everything. And then you realize, oh, this is not this isn't even like structured right. Or, you know, you learn, I mean, like any business, whatever you're doing, whether you're, you know, 
whether you're an actor, whether you're a, you know, a, a building equipment, whether you're building an empire, whether, you know, I'm sure everyone learns lessons along the way. And I think for me now, yeah, in the, in the investment space, it's really got to, it's got to resonate with me personally. I never want to be involved in something that I don't believe in or I wouldn't, I wouldn't use even if I wasn't an investor. Like everything I'm surrounded by, even if the door was closed, I would still be, even if the door was closed as an investor, I would still be using that product or be going to that place. Right. And I can gladly say that, like, you know, whether it was, you know, I, I would be using a climber every day without a doubt, even if I never met the founder and I never, you know, got involved in the company and I was never even a part of it because it's genuinely a great machine. I would drink Cali water because I love the taste of it. And I think that's the authenticity that's mm. like, um, that, that will, I guess, shine through because I think people realize like, oh, you know, he really believes in that or he truly does want this to become something great. And I think that's it. And then you get presented with a lot of opportunities that some I've said no to and they've done great. And, and then, you know, I wish them nothing but the best, but it's, if it doesn't resonate with me, I don't really want to do it, you know? Right. So what interested you about Dog Pound? You know, one, where did the name come from? We were talking about doggy treats just off camera, but like, how, where did the name come from and what was the backstory of getting involved in it? The name came from, uh, so Kurt Myers, the founder of Dog Pound, founder of Dog Pound. He was a, um, a personal trainer, obviously. Um, his story in himself is incredible of how he got to where he was to then being a personal trainer. Um, but that's a, that would be a podcast for you guys. <laughs> um, but basically, he was training people and they were meeting at the park every day at like 5 a.m., 6 a.m. And they would bring their dogs and tie the dogs to the little fences there. Um, in New York, and uh, they nicknamed themselves a dog pound. And then Kirk, I guess, you know, at one point was like, it was, his clientele was growing and some really interesting people like Hugh Jackman and stuff like that, um, and people like that, and uh, eventually was like, I want to do my own gym, and, you know, the, the rest is history. I got involved in dog pound. I got introduced to it by a friend. Um, I was actually in New York um, hosting the pre-show for the Grammys, and... Uh, Surprisingly, I made it to the gym because there was a lot of you know parties that, that during that time as well. Um, and a friend just kept saying, "You've got to try out this gym." And uh, eventually, I went in there and I was mind blown because um, I got pretty pretty bored of gyms. I never I don't know about you, but like especially in Hastings, there was never gyms really growing up. <laughs> we played football, or you know, you ran in the park, or you know. So the gyms for me was always just a tough connect. I'd find myself in a gym, spend an hour there, and I haven't really done anything. Um, and I went to Dog Pound and was just blown away. Like the energy in there, the, the I, I guess the, the aesthetic of the place, it didn't feel like a gym. Um, the trainers were great. They'd, they'd have this kind of like mind game way of like being friendly, but not friendly. Like friendly enough that you thought they were, your, you know, <laughs> you were just having banter, but secretly you're sweating and burning calories and building muscle, you know? Um, and I just fell in love with it. And I was like, you know, Kirk and I got introduced and we went for a few dinners and, um, just became like, you know, friends first and then was like, you know, we should, you know, do, do more um, mm. together. And that's what we did. And then, yeah, we opened, uh, we opened LA um, on my birthday. What was that? Two, two and a half years, be two and a half, two, two years, three years ago this May. So two and a half years. Right. Um, we just had our second anniversary this last May. Um, and it's been a, it's been a, you know, great adventure. And I think, you know, to answer your question why I got involved is, is for that reason. I think the same reason why people train in the gym. It's just got, it's, it's, it's like a, it's got a magical feel when you walk into the place. It's got a, a real energy and a buzz that you don't walk in being like, oh, I'm in a gym, I've got to work out. You walk in being like, can't wait to work out. You know, it's like you pull up outside a dog pound, you can't wait to go in. Normally, for me at least, I pull up outside a gym and I'm like, maybe I should just make another call. You know, <laughs> should I push today's session, <clears throat> you know? Um, so he's built something really special. Yeah, it's for considering. There's, I think there's just two locations yeah. at the moment. Um, and I was, I, I was, as I was researching, I, I saw the uh, collaboration with with uh, Bauman, um, yeah. in with the, with the shoes yeah, yeah. and like huge luxury fashion brand. For those who probably don't know what it is, and and so how did a, how did kind of like I guess a small studio pull off like a, a big you know it's a big deal making shoes for yeah it's you know it's i understand how difficult it is to put your name on a set of dumbbells so i can't imagine the what yeah had to we happen. have done a we we actually did a collaboration during uh covid as well with a brand called rta which is a, a fashion apparel brand um not at that level but but you know very uh, la brand done very well all around the world now and we kind of like broke the ice with that um and then fell into this opportunity with the shoes 
and really that's through uh, Olivier, the creative, the old uh, creative director of Balmain, knew like Kirk. Kirk had trained some of the models. You know, it's like a. I guess once you're in the mix, you're in the mix. Right. Um, and it was just a conversation that that started to like become real, and then suddenly, you know, there's a limited edition shoe. And I think that's the magical thing about Dog Pound is it falls in these places, and you'll be on these calls, and like suddenly, like this person's coming to the gym, and you're like, how does this? It, it doesn't make sense for the best possible no, reason. I've never seen it before. Like no. the biggest gym chains and some and I, very cool brands, but yeah. that seemed very unique for such a. And I think that's what we try and do. <clears throat> we try and do unique stuff, and I think that's been a that's been a you know a key conversation around like a lot of our partnerships and what we do is not taking that quick fix, you know, because um, there's a lot of money to be made in collaborations, and there's a lot of you know in the fast fashion space, you know, they're writing big checks. And we've had a lot come through the door that's like, hey, you know, we'd love to do these, you know, uh, gym shorts or, you know, gym shorts. Because you're doing las you. lasso socks, is, is, is that as well? I saw. Got, you got them on. I've yeah. got them on. By the way, that's just coincidence. <laughs> um, I actually, it's not coincidence. I actually wear these. Even my dad, I've got them wearing every day now. I, I actually shout at them if they're not wearing them because my dad suffers from arthritis and it's really like helped him. Um, with the compression socks. Um, Do those, have, those, have you seen those? Because I, I suppose there's a lot of work in pulling them together. And in principle, you know, I've sat around the table with people and they're like, well, that's a great idea. But does it, you know, does it achieve what like both brands are looking to achieve from some of those collabs? Yeah, I mean, it has, the, the socks themselves <laughs> has, you know, has genuine ankle support and compression. And there's no, there's no uh, downside for anyone with, a, with that sock. If you're active and you're walking or you're running or you're traveling even, I mean, I, I, won't, I won't get on a plane without them now. Because I've never, the last, I mean, couple of years of, you know, uh, wearing them, I've never had like the, you know, the, the numbness or the pins and needles that you get sometimes traveling. So it's, uh, I, I genuinely swear by them. Um, so it's great. But yeah, going back to the question of the partnerships, I think that's what we've, we've, trusted ourselves in is not taking that like you know million dollar deal to do a you know a bunch of t-shirts with a fast fashion brand and we've held out for the big ones because the truth is in that area in the collaboration space and we're doing some really cool stuff with climate that we've got coming up too and that's the same thing is you're only really as good you can't go from like in my opinion you can't go from doing a collaboration here to then doing a collaboration here you can do it yeah. the other way around you know yeah um but you can't, you know, so you're only as good as your last game, really. Mm. Um, and what do, you, what do you have to put into them to sort of ensure that they do deliver what both parties want and they don't end up sort of, like you say, putting in a position where you probably, you've not got future doors open because you've blown it? I mean, I think you have to go into it with a mutual kind of understanding of what's expected, expectations. I like to always be, you know, an open book and transparent about, okay, how are we doing this collaboration? You know, what are we looking to do? What are we looking to achieve? Is it revenue based? You know, a lot of collaborations aren't revenue focused. Mm -hmm. Believe it or not, a lot of collaborations are like, this is awareness focused. You know, this right. is for the, for the wow factor. Um, we break even and make a little bit of money, but we want to, you know, do that. And then there's a the conversation that's like, no, this is revenue focused. Great. Well, then let's have that conversation. How many do we need to know? How, many, how much of the product do we need to make? How, how, you know, what quality level are we making at? What's the price point? Um, so they, they really are, that, that, that to me is the way to go into any collaboration is the expectation. What is this for? Is it for awareness? Is it for revenue? Is it for both? Right. Because it completely changes that mindset around what, what you want to do. Um, and I think for us, you know, obviously there's a mutual, the reason Dog Pound gets the opportunities that you're talking about is because they built a great awareness, you know? Um, the gym is, you know, to have two locations and I, if I'm in London wearing my dog pound cap, someone will be like, oh, do you go dog pound? And it's, it's crazy that, you know, and that's one of the, obviously I've bashed social media a lot during this podcast, but that's one of the, you know, the advantages of social media. You can be a, you know, a brick and water gym with two locations, but be known all over the world because of social media. That's it. There's no other, there's not any other reason. We wouldn't be known all over the world without social media. So that's played every part in it. Um, so on social media, then just <clears throat> just on that point, like you're you're in the film and movie business and television and entrepreneur gyms and a number of other things. Like, w would you say today how 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 important now is social media in success? Whether it is movies, television, business, it, it, what what percentage of, of the success is uh, um, is it around? You know, if you if you're not 
cracked it on social media, you're probably not going to do as well as somebody who has done. I think it varies depending on the product that you're selling, right? for sure. Um, because obviously retail still plays a big part. You know, brick and mortar retail is still massive really? for, for other brands. Yeah, 100% is still there. Um, but also, um, I think it, it, always, it always goes back to, I think the foundation of anything is the product. You know, and I, I, when I say product, I mean whether it's a company like Dog Pound or whether it's a sock like Lasso or, you know, whether it's a hot tub company, whatever it is, is its product because that's longevity. You can have a quick fix and a quick run on, on social media. If, if, you're, if you're making crap stuff, you get away with it for a certain amount, but I feel like eventually you're going to burn out. You know, it's like that quick... You that's know, good to know. The, the marketplace back home, you know, you'll go to like Folkestone Market or one of these <laughs> markets and it's like, buy this, buy that, and you'd sell a few. And then within like a few months, you're caught out. You're like, that yeah. broke. Yeah. This didn't work. So I think long game, it's always about the product. If you build an incredible product and pay attention to detail, you'll eventually break through the other noise and then go ahead of the ones that, you know, are, yeah. are just focused on social media. So I think... And would you be, say that, that when you say product, that comes around the quality and, and what you put into that? Quality, design, everything, <clears throat> you know? Right. Um, and I think that's where maybe a lot of companies go wrong is it's t- they're too quick to get, to get around social media and think that that's all that matters. And then the infrastructure or the, you know, the rest isn't there and it fails. And I'm talking from, you know, experience of like, you know, the earlier days of when you say about the lessons I've learned, that was one of them for sure. It's like you can't do it that way. You have to focus on the product and play the long game and get things right and, you know, do it that way. And then, of course, without a doubt, social media plays a massive part in your success. Success. More sort of like fuel once you've got, you've built that engine, but it's not. Exactly. Exactly. It's not the the thing on its own. Yeah. Yeah. So what about Climber then? You know, I, I guess interesting, very interesting product. I, I saw it for the first time. I went to Ursa, um, mm-hmm. I think this year or last year, I can't remember. Last but year. Yeah. Last year, yeah. right. Um, so what, what, what caused you to get involved in that? Because I suppose there's, a, there's quite a few of these new fitness products, like Peloton was probably the first one where it's, you, you're connecting a product with the experience. And, and my guess is that's sort of along a similar vein. Um, what, what got you interested and what... what makes that different to some of the other connected ones like Tonal and Peloton, etc. Yeah, um, honestly, the, the only thing that got me involved initially was the founder, without a doubt. I got connected through uh, to Avram El Makis by a friend. And uh, in all transparency at the time, when he was like, oh, I want to connect you th- th- with, this, with this guy, they're doing, a, you know, they're doing a fitness product and blah, blah. It was, and I don't mean this in a mean way, it was like in one ear and out the other. It just didn't resonate really with me. Um, and then I had a Zoom with Avram, and he was just, just such a brilliant man, and, and the passion and the vision, um, and then learned more about Climber. And then he was very quickly to say, you know, why don't you just get on a, you know, get on a plane, come to Denver, see the, see the product, see the machine, meet the team. And that was a, it was a no-brainer. It was like there was literally zero doubt in my mind I, I was like, this is, this is it, you know, you know I'm involved. Um, and I think that's what, you know, once again, it's, it goes back to the conversation about the people as well, you know, the product and the, and the people. And for me, it was like, you know, Climber, without a doubt, is an incredible concept, but the reason it's incredible is because of the founder, you know? Right. And, I, and then that's probably the reason why it hasn't been done, you know? Um, because climbing's been around for many, many years, and, and every top athlete in the world knows that climbing is you know, or any top trainer will tell you climbing is, you know, probably the best workout you can do. Um, It's great on the body, it's zero impact, you know, whatever age, whatever you are, you know, uh, you should be climbing because you're keeping your spine, you know, in the the position it's meant to be in. There's zero impact on the body, so you're not bashing your knees like when you're running, you're not rowing and damaging your back. It's the best exercise, so why has no one taken it and done something why is there a versa climber that's you know let's be honest it's the most old-fashioned machine in the gym you walk into any gym if there's a versa climber you're like oh there's the 60s here's the year you know 2022 um so i truly think you know the answer to that the reason why there is a you know and that there is climber now and there is this new technology and everything else is because the founder with the vision so with climber then right what um, we were talking before that it's a slightly different route to market than right. I guess everyone else is going. Can you talk a little bit about what they're doing now? 
Yeah, I mean, you know, we're, we're definitely, our trainers are incredible. Um, the content we're creating is second to none. And I think it's, uh, it's more than just the machine. We're doing a lot of workouts, you know, off the machine too. Um, we also have our studio climber, which is, uh, if you think of, you know, there used to be a concept called Rise Nation, yeah. which is the climbing classes. In LA, um, I yeah, exactly. They were LA, I think they, they were all over. Um, it's just the more advanced version of that. The machines are better, the equipment's better. Um, and the, 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 the studio, you know, is pretty much like a nightclub. There's the light fixtures that go with the sound of every beat. It's crazy. Um, so there's that part of the business too. Um, you know, and then we're doing a ton around, you know, collaborations and things like that. I think we're- UFC, I think you've got UFC, stuff, we're the official, yeah, connected fitness partner of the UFC, um, which we can talk about because that one's out there. I mean, the Denver Nuggets, we're the official partner of those. Um, there's a lot of excitement around the product and obviously we have some amazing people involved as well as investors um, but I think the reason being is because it goes back to climbing being you know one of the best exercises you can do mm. and athletes believe in it so it's it's just kind of like moving at a speed that's you know insane I've never seen anything like it like I've never seen a product launch and and go this quickly right um, and you know we're being we're being disruptive as well. Like as you say, we don't we don't want to follow the lead of like a Peloton or someone like that. Like we want to do our own thing. You know, they're they're in. They're, you do whatever you like. You know, we do we we do our thing and you do your thing. And you know, wish you all the best. Yeah. So in in the space, like the, I suppose people think of health and wellness around generally exercise. But I suppose as I've started to get older and and also studied the industry a bit more, there's a lot more longevity and health that becomes more important. Um, recovery is an example. And I was looking at another business on your website, which is called Next Health. Yes. So what, what got you interested in that? And what, what's the sort of philosophy? What are they trying to do? Because that, that seemed, I don't, I've not seen too many businesses like that at right. the moment. So uh, Next Health, the founder, Kevin Peake, um, uh, he developed it. It's a, a health optimization, like basically. So it's, uh, you, you know, uh, get healthy before you get something wrong with you. You know, it's a uh, pre prevent disease before you have disease. And I think too much of the health industry is around like, oh, I'm sick now, yeah. let's fix it. So this is more of the opposite. It's like stay healthy, get ahead of it. And it's all the, you know, the future health optimization in a nutshell is the access to, you know, things that we have now, you know, with science and with everything else that we never had before. And these incredible, you know, products that, you know, Next Health will curate and put in their locations, whether it's, you know, a cryo, whether it's a LED bed, and then it goes to, you know, more of the IVs, uh, stem cells, the PRP, you know, everything that I guess from all around the world, like the best of the best, as far as equipment, as far as science, as far as, you know, um, the medical standpoint um, is curated into these locations. I've seen, I've been into one of Dave Asprey's locations, yeah. and that is... It, that's, Bulletproof Labs. Right, yeah. yeah Similar. Okay. It's not, not, not much different other than Next Health is really ahead of it in the way of uh, the medical side, like the IVs, uh, the stem cell, the PRP, the, you know, a lot of that stuff that they do there, exosomes. I mean, it's, a, it's definitely ahead of its game for sure. Do you think that's going to be something that you'll start seeing a lot more of? Without a doubt. I mean, I've been doing uh, something called NAD for a, for a couple of years now. How did you um, get on with that? Amazing. Really? Absolutely love it. I've been it. thinking I about yesterday. trying it. Yeah. It's brilliant. What, what sort of benefits do you get? Um, energy levels. I mean, I, I, NAD stands for something really long. You'll have to use subtitles. <laughs> yes. You know what I mean? It's like a really long word. But I Google all the time because I'm like, the next interview, I'm going to say it. <laughs> it's not going to happen. Um, but it's, uh, it's, it's basically what fuels your cells. Right. In layman's terms, in a Hastings lad's terms, it's what fuels your cells. So, and obviously your cells, you know, cellular health is everything. It's what, you know, if your cells are healthy, your organs are healthy, you know, it slows down aging, um, gives you energy. I mean, it's a, it's a lot. And honestly, the reason I started doing it was because someone told me, um, and it was weird. It came from like a, it wasn't like someone in that realm. It was like a, a mental health therapist was like, have you tried NAD? Because they had used it a lot um, for addiction and they used it a lot in the mental health space. Oh. They had taken people that had kind of like, you know, just lost themselves and pumped them full of NAD and suddenly there's this mental clarity around it as well. Do you inject so, it or you take tablets? Or? Uh, you could, there's, there's tablets, there's, you know, you could, you could t I don't inject it myself, you can, you can get injections, but I always do it for an IV. Mm. So about 750 milligrams for an IV. Um, 
definitely the first time you do it, you'll feel like you're about to poop your pants. Really? Um, your tummy will hurt, um, <laughs> but you get used to it, your body gets used to it. I swear by it, I think it's brilliant. So we do that in Next Health as well. That was the first place that I kind of, you know, tried it out as well and kind of a regular now as well. Right. And the other one which I was quite interested in is you've got like an invite only business, which is, is it called Arthur? Yeah. How well, do you it's, get... pronou- it's pronounced. The, uh, uh, my dear friends who are the founders, um, Priyanka and Karan, um, Indian couple, it's pronounced art. Oh, art, okay. But I, I call it Arthur and it, <laughs> it annoys them. Um, so yeah, it's mind, body and soul. Um, and it's a, it's a really interesting concept. Um, so basically, if you think of like a Soho house okay. or something like that, like a membership model, um, it's that but in a wellness space. Um, but it's not as in like membership as in you can't get in, but they create a community in the place and then once that's full, they open another location right. and they see the demand. So like currently West Hollywood was our first and then Studio City will be our next. We've already got the location that's in construction and then we go to Santa Monica. Um, West Hollywood is pretty much, you know, filled up very quickly. And we launched during COVID, which was a really, as mm-hmm. you know, a tough time to launch anything. Yeah. Um, but it's basically a one-stop shop. So you've got yoga there, got some incredible yoga teachers. Um, you've got meditation. You've got float tanks, you've got infrared sauna, you've got cryo, you've got massage, and then you've got all the other like added things that come into like, um, you've got the cryo facials, you've got, uh, I don't even know what it's called, endomology, endomology, where they like wrap you in something and it's like, oh, okay. it gets rid of the, all that, all that stuff. It's like the, you know, technology there. Um, but it's basically, I would say the main focus of it is, is mind, body and soul. Mm. Um, so float tanks, you know, saunas and stuff like that. And then it's a price point that, you know, I don't think you could find anywhere. It's, uh, I think it's around like 140 bucks a month and it's unlimited. Wow. Um, so you get like a, you know, you get a chunk of cryos to use, you get infrared saunas, you get yoga classes, you get everything for that price point a month. So do you see these, this, these concepts expanding into Europe? You mentioned sort of some stuff in the Middle East um, that you were looking at. Like, is, is, are they, is these sort of, you test it in, in California and then they're going to be going, you're going to expand around the world? Or what? Yeah, I think California is a great place to test things because it's very uh, fickle, yeah. you know, and if people are honest there as well, if they don't like your place, they, they're going down the street. So it's a, good, it's a good testing point and also it's a great place to test it and also build the awareness. Because um, obviously we're, you know, we're in a great hub of that. And it's also people are down to, I think there's a lot of, you know, uh, openness to like try new things and get that kind of feedback. Mm. Um, but it's a great place to test it. But yeah, the vision with, I, I would say, I mean, definitely nationwide with any of these companies. I mean, mm. Next Health, we have, we have uh, two in LA. We opened New York uh, during COVID. And then we have, uh, we had a, we still have a pop-up. We had a pop-up, still have it at the Four Seasons in Maui. And then that's going to expand through the Four Seasons kind of group as well. Um, and then, as I said, art is going to be West Hollywood, Shudo City, Santa Monica. And that will definitely expand probably down your neck of the woods, like Laguna, Newport, and then try that, California. Um, kind of like a lot of business models, I guess, what we're doing with the beverage as well. It's like you get California, mm. you go East Coast, you go, you know, it's that kind of like... A, 101 playbook i guess right. and then you know if all goes well and you get the cash injections you need then you go you know international, international yeah. yeah how would you define the sort of health and wellness space now because i suppose you, you you've you know you go back to england quite a lot and i suppose there was the traditional health and fitness clubs which that was about it really all this stuff you're talking about is is pretty new and cutting edge how, how would you define sort of where it's going now from from your experience as an investor and and, and, you know, sort of, I suppose, having a good understanding of what's going on around the world in that area. I think there's a massive increase. Um, I think people are more, you know, even my parents who, you know, are visiting at the moment, they're more open minded or, or I should say they're paying attention more to what they eat or what they do. You know, I think uh, obviously COVID shook the world up as well, uh, made us all kind of look like how we're living, what we're doing. Um, And I think health and wellness is a great space to be in. I think people have now found like enjoyment in that, you know, it's like the new cool thing to do, you know, it's not, I find it even with, you know, some of the younger people, um, I hate when I say like some of the younger people, because I'm like, shit, isn't that me? Yeah, it's not me now. (laughs) Um, You know, the younger people, like it's not, it's not so much cool to go out to a nightclub and get wasted and stay up all night. Like in our day, that was, that was what you did. If you didn't do it, you were weird. Yeah. 
And that's different now. It's, it's now cool to go to a gym or to go do something like that or go to like a spiritual retreat or go Costa Rica and do, you know, yoga. And the, the world has definitely shifted for mm. sure, you know. People want to see the sunrise now, you know. Um, that not was coming never, in from the Not night coming night in, after. exactly. <laughs> you know? um, normally you'd be in the kebab shop, you know, getting your, getting your kebab and chips, um, watching, the, watching the sunrise. Um, yeah, it's different now, I think. And that's a great place to be because there's a lot of happiness in, in watching the, you know, I guess the, you wake up as the world wakes up, you know, mm. and it's, it's, it's a nice way to live. And I think people are, people are realizing that, you know, it's a, we're influenced by society so much. I always say it's like a, a, a reference for me is like, you know, it became like, like alcohol and drinking and, and red wine and everything is, is amazing. But the only reason we, at least the only reason for me I thought it was amazing is because like you see it in movies, like it's romantic, mm. it's a date, right? You're, if, you're, if you're at a table, you're that. Drinking is culture, the drink is that. And then you realize like, oh, that's really what I've just been told. Yeah. You know? Um, that's that sort of image and that. Of course. And yeah, then we train to believe it. that. Yeah. And I feel like now because of like what's on TV, what's on YouTube, what's on Instagram, it's not all about that. It's now like people doing healthy stuff, people doing that. I think, you know, we're inspired by what we're around mm -hmm. and what you see. So I feel like it's shifting. And with the shift is like a ripple effect of then everything we're watching. Mm -hmm. You know, I think there's a... You know, people will now go on YouTube and search 20 minute yoga or will search meditation or will search breath work. You know, before people would go on YouTube and search, you know, raves, yeah. you know, or, you know, illegal parties. Well, you didn't or, used to you go know, on whatever. YouTube. You used to kind of like get on the phone number and sort of, you know, text. Or I used to switch on pirate radio, <laughs> see where the next party was, you know. <laughs> Meet me at the train station, six o'clock. <laughs> and there was nothing. And there. then you'll hear the, pl the police sirens. And you're like, oh, yeah. Um, no, so I feel like the world is shifting in yeah. that way, for sure. And what about mental health? Because you, you talk a lot about it, and it's obviously been something you work on. Is, is there any business investments or any business opportunities that you see in that space that are interesting? Yeah, I mean, it's all, I mean, it all play, to me, it all plays into it. I think everything I'm involved in plays a big element, at least in my mental health, and I think mental health, because if your body's right, if you feel good, you know, it's that, cl I mean, everyone knows this. It's like, if you go to the gym, you normally feel a bit better mentally, mm. you know? Um, if, you're, if you're eating right, you normally feel better mentally. If you're, you know, doing things that make your body feel better, your mind normally follows. Um, so I feel like, you know, most of the things I'm involved in, you know, play an element in mental health. Um, but yeah, it's something that I'm always like digging into. It's something that uh, I'm always, you know, uh, keeping an eye out for. There's actually a product that I that I got sent to, sent one recently, um, end of last year, and tried, and it became like a gift that I gave out over Christmas because I was that blown away by it. It's called Hap Hap B, right. so H A P B E E, and it's a. Uh, I'm going to ruin the tech, the founder of Hap B. If you watch this, I'm sorry for my description, but it's basically this device that you put around your neck, and uh, by magnetic waves and sounds, they can, they can change the way you feel. Really? So they have different, uh, uh, you know, like a, if you went on Spotify and there's a playlist, they have a playlist of what you want to feel. So there's a wake up one. There's like a midday slump one. There's like a sleep one. And I kid you not, I was like, eh, okay. Um, and put this thing on. And the one for me that I do all the time is midday slump. Because I always find like, you know, if, you, if you're working a lot and you're up at six, by like two, three p.m., you're like, oh, yeah. I need a nap. And I'd put this thing on for like 20 minutes and you just wear it and you just feel awesome. Um, oh. So I feel like it's quite an exciting time because with technology and obviously the science and the data and everything else that we have access to now, um, people are developing some really interesting products mm. that can really help, you know, the way you feel. And I think that's, uh, that's an exciting thing. And I definitely want to get more involved in that space. And on, on a personal level, I'm always looking for things like that. So I'm sure, you know, eventually it will become part of my portfolio in that reason so do you set goals and and if so like do you have like you've achieved like you're still pretty young in your 40s compared to me and you've 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 got you know you've got you've got some amazing successes to line up what what if you if you do set and what what what's next for you what are you sort of thinking about um i don't know i kind of try and stay in the moment i kind of have to stay in the moment because i'm that busy that mm. like truly i'm like i don't really get to think about what's next um, do you plan like at the beginning of the year, do you sort of like say, okay, well this year I want to do this and not do that? 
No. no. Just go with the flow. No, I don't. I mean, I have That's like personal good, things. Yeah. I have personal things. But as far as business, truly, like it gets to the point where there's that much going on. I just want to get through that. And then when if I always also believe like it sounds cheesy, but life always I've found that at 40 years old, like I said, like I've had a weird roller coaster journey, but you find that life normally presents itself the way it's going to happen. Mm. So, you know, start every day with just trust that it's going to play out the way it's going to play out. And whatever you believe in the universe, God, y your best friend, your, your dog, um, that it's going to give it to you the way that, you know, it's meant to happen and then just stay in that moment. That's what I try and do. Definitely on a personal level, like, of course, like the new year starts and it's like, what do you want to be better at this year? And I'm like, patience. And, you know, I've got like a list of things that I want to improve on and stuff like that. Um, but on a business level, I mean, you know, obviously the companies I'm involved in, like Climber, Cali Water, like I want to see them, you know, grow and get on a, you know, a scale that we all want our businesses to go on. You know, like we want to, you know, I'd love, love Cali Water to whether it's end of this year or next year, you know, whether we sell out to, you know, a major or whether we go international, or whatever that is. But, you know, obviously there's the obvious business goals, but I feel like that uh, that's obvious because yeah. otherwise, why would you be doing it? It's like, right. I, don't, I don't know anyone that starts a beverage company is like, I just want to stay in five stores, you know? <laughs> um, so there's that kind of obvious play. Um, but as far as business itself, no, I just want to, you know, I continue, continue, you know, I'm happy with the way things are going. So I just want to continue that. Um, but definitely, like I said, find that balance as well, because it does get it does get to a point where I catch myself and I'm like, I used to love watching movies and now I'm watching a movie and I'm on my phone replying to emails. So I want to I want to find that balance again, which I think is really important for us all to do. Um, we're in a world where we can be contacted at any time. That didn't used to be the case. As I said, my parents have businesses, you know, built successful businesses, but they were never you could never get hold of them past 6 p.m. unless someone called the home phone. And then it was because the place was burning down or something, you know, um, so I feel like we need to get a bit of structure back and, and find, find a good work-life balance. That's important. But no, as far as goals, no. I mean, I love my acting, you know, that acting is, as I say, it's like my passion and my hobby. And so the more I can do that, the more I'm, you know, happy as well. And, you know, who knows? So what does success mean to you then? How, you, how do you define that both, I guess, professionally and, and, and personally? Um, I've definitely learned that success does not come with what I thought success was, you know? I, I always thought success was, was, uh, was money or was things or was, was that. And that doesn't mean that I don't like money, you know? I'm not gonna bullshit and be like, I don't need money. I fucking, you know, love being successful. I love money, I love things. I love a nice home and stuff like that. But it's not gonna get me what I thought it was gonna get me. That is gonna come from the self-work and, you know, um, working on myself and I think that's a it's so annoying when those like when you hear so many cliche sayings growing up and then you're like oh shit they're a cliche saying for a reason because they've stuck around for hundreds of years or however long because they're actually true um, but it really does start with yourself you know you've got to you, you've got to get that right and it goes back to like the story of I said like you know you go to places whether it's Thailand or, you know, wherever you're going and, and you see people with very little or at least you think very little from a from a material standpoint. And yet they're happier and more content, you know, mm. than anyone, you know, then you're, it's, you're clearly thinking about the wrong thing. So mm. I think for me, learning that success is, you know, it, it really does come from within. Um, but at the same time, I also get real enjoyment out of my work um, and success. So it's finding that balance of like not getting too like deep into into, you know, the the the, the goals, not getting too deep into like, you know, the end goal, you know. Right. So I've got two questions before we finish. Um, I, I, I listened to you talk about this statement, which I thought was really nice. And I was curious to, to, to see what meaning you put to it. And it, it says um, um, it's always OK in the end. If not, it's not the end. It, it's uh, always OK in the end. If it's not OK, it's if not, it's not the okay, end. It's not the end. That was my grandma that used to, uh, used to always say that. So what does that mean to you and in, in, in your life? Um, I think probably plays back into now you've said it and hearing someone else say it, um, persistence came to mind, which, which never did ever oh, come to mind in that quote. I didn't think about that when I read it as well. But it never did before for me. It was always <laughs> just a case of like, obviously my grandma would say it, my mum would say it. It's like you go through tough times, like, you know, we touch base on one of them, but it was like, it's always okay in the end. If it's not okay, it's not the end. Basically meaning like, just 
get through this, it's going to be okay. Mm. And then if it's not okay, it's, you're done anyway. Yeah. You know, if it is the end, then what are you stressing about? Yeah. So it kind of like that kind of Irish mentality. My grandma was Irish of being like, uh, oh, you'll be fine. You'll be fine. You'll be fine. That was what I always took from it. Right. You'll be fine. Just stick it out. You'll be fine. You know, um, push through. Um, but now when you just said it, and obviously our conversation earlier, I feel like it definitely plays into persistence a bit, mm -hmm. which is the same thing, really. If you push through and you trust and you get through, that's the same as really persistence because right. you're giving it another go. You're pushing through another day. It's only really when you're like, I've had enough, whether you're talking about yourself, whether you're talking about your business, whether you're talking about your relationship, that's really when it ends, right? With anything. Yeah. Is, is that moment where you're like, you give up. Very good. So last question then. Escape Your Limits is about escaping what you've believed is impossible and gone on to make it possible. What would be a memorable example outside of what we've spoken about of where you've escaped your personal limits? Mm. Outside of what we've already spoken about? Yeah. Um, I think, to be honest, that Escape My Personal Limits is, is the stuff I'm doing now, the business stuff. Because there's no part of me that, you know, as I say, I had an upbringing on the stage and dancing and, you know, acting and, and that sort of life. Um, so I guess more of escaping, you know, my limits is, is now like I'm, I guess, in the entrepreneurial space and, and the business space. I would have never, I never expected it. And I'm sure most of the people around me, I mean, wouldn't, maybe, maybe they expected it. I don't know. I think it's more, that's a, that's a good example, I guess. Um, if that's kind of what you meant by the question. Yeah, there's, yeah. there's no right or wrong yeah. answer. Just and like, I think that's it. You trust in that, like, and I think we're in such a great time of, like, not that I'm telling anyone not to finish school <laughs> or don't go to school, but there's so much you can learn from the world, you mm. know, the access we have from, from, you know, online, from people. I do believe that, like, you have to find, you can't learn everything from a book or a computer. You have to get out in life. Like, I'm a big believer of that. I think the... The amount of lessons you learn, you learn by being outside in the world and taking risks and doing that and mistakes you make will teach you more than any textbook or any laptop or any Google search or any science degree, I believe, mm. you know. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. I think go out and live. Thank you very much, of sir. Of course. That was Pleasure. wonderful. really enjoyed cool. it. Thank I was you. about to leave, but I realized we're, we're <laughs> in my home. <laughs> Hey, I hope you enjoyed this podcast. If you did, then please go over to iTunes and subscribe to the Escape Your Limits podcast. Leave a review, leave a comment. It really would help us a lot to continue to keep these going.